evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bob Kowalski, and you are on Nightly Interviews. My first guest tonight is Dr. Tara Smith. How are you this evening? I'm very good, Bob. Thank you for having me. I've heard from many people that you are interested in how relationships work between people and how to get the most of personal gain out of these relationships. Yeah, Bob, you know, I strongly believe that the only way to succeed in today's environment is to be competitive and work towards self-promotion. Uh, some people think that I'm slightly biased and conceited, but I think that's the only way to be successful in life. Can you please elaborate? You know, in general, I think the competition is the main driving force in everything we do <coughs> as humans. We base our happiness on what goals we set for ourselves and our abilities to obtain those goals. If you can't obtain them, then you're going to have a better life. If you can't, you won't. So where do morals fit into your view of human relationships? My opinions of morals are that they're the driving force behind the goals that we set for ourselves. For example, if we want a relationship, then we have to have the morals like being honest, loving, and affectionate. However, it's important to realize that those morals are just to make you happy. So would you consider yourself an egoist? Yeah, I think I would. You know, the only other option is to be an altruist, and that just doesn't make any sense at all. What doesn't make sense about it? I think it is important to give to others. Well, altruists are truly givers. So, to be constantly giving and never receiving just doesn't make sense. Because if everyone's giving and no one's receiving, then are you really even giving to anyone in the first place? You make an interesting point. But, would, but how would you feel if you were giving to someone in dire need of help? They would be receiving the help they needed, and you would gain personal satisfaction of knowing that you helped another person. You know, I consider myself to be a principled egoist, which is a little bit different. I think it's important for others to benefit from our self-promotions. So being said, I think that that situation would warrant us to behave in a kind manner towards that person. Because by acting upon those moral characters, it would lead to your, lead to your own self-gain and help you achieve self-satisfaction. So you aren't heartless? No, not at all. Even though some people think I'm extreme, I don't wish to be heartless. My main position is to, go, uh, to strive for personal gain. If that can't be achieved from a certain action or behavior, then you just shouldn't do it. Dr. Tara Smith, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening and giving us your, your points on life. It was a pleasure to be here, Bob. Thanks for having me. My next guest this evening is philosopher, Mr. Kant. How are you doing this evening? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Now, we have just heard from Dr. Tara Smith. She highlighted the importance of self-promotion in society. Do you agree that personal gain is or should be the driving force behind all of our actions? I happen to disagree with Dr. Smith. Um, she seems to be focusing on the results of our actions and that we should always be focused on what we, meaning the person who's doing the action, is going to get out of it. I think this is entirely the wrong way to go about our lives. Could you elaborate some more, please? Uh, we shouldn't have to be worried about what we will get out of every situation. For example, if we're respectful to other people, there shouldn't be any other motive behind that. We shouldn't just respect people because we want other people to respect us back. What would you suggest should be the right motives behind our actions, then, if it is not to get positive in return? There shouldn't be any motives behind our actions. We should be doing what is right because it is the right thing to do. The most important factor that makes us a moral person is the, mo is the motives for how we act. So you think we should always do, do what they think is right in every situation? Uh, yes, yeah, some people call me crazy because they think I take this idea to the extreme sometimes. What do you mean? Well, I think that everyone should always tell the truth, and I mean that literally. I don't think there should be any exception to, the, to this rule even if you think you're doing it for their own good. But how would you expect everyone to somehow know what is the right thing to do in every situation? We're all rational beings. We're born that way. It is a rational being that tells us what to do. But that doesn't mean that everyone is going to do it just because the rational being tells them to. This goes back to the example I just gave about lying to someone. Your rational being would tell you that it's wrong to lie. However, you can talk yourself into thinking that you're doing it for the, the good of the other person. You might think that it's okay to lie then. However, it's still wrong to do so. This is where I believe the categorical imperative comes in. What is categorical imperative? The categor categorical imperative is something that I believe strongly in. Basically, it's just a fancy title for moral standards that we should live by if we want to be moral people. Anyone can become familiar with these. But what if a person still has doubts 
about what the moral action would be in a particular situation after they have consulted their rational being. There's just one final test in a situation like that to determine what is moral, and that's never to use anybody. If you're just acting a certain way to get what you want out of that person, then that is not a good justification to make that action moral. Well, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Kant, for coming on this evening. Thanks for having me. Hello, and welcome to the program. Why don't you introduce yourself to us? Hi, everyone. Yeah. My name is Jake Sullivan, heir to the Sullivan Brewing Fortune. Hello, Sullivan! Yes. Oh! Please explain your recent experiences with the mind scan procedure. Well, I'm glad you asked. Initially, I thought the procedure was a great idea, to preserve myself, or at least a version of myself, without the constant threat of death looming over my head. However, I always assumed that my consciousness would end up in the immortal, synthetic body, and instead, I'm still trapped in this body. Wow, that sounds pretty bad, but didn't you agree to partition your consciousness, didn't you? Well, yes I did, and I wasn't exactly happy about being shipped off to the moon, but at least at that time, I thought I only had a few years left to live, and so I accepted it. However, soon after my extraterrestrial exile, a cure was developed for my disease. Did that change your viewpoint? It changed everything! Calm down, sir. <laughs> now that I'm not going to die in a few years, and as the biological original, I deserve to live out the remainder of my life on Earth. So you believe, as the or original, biological version of yourself, you deserve to be over your synthetic copy? Of course I do. He's going to live forever anyway. Why shouldn't I be able to live out the last few decades I have with my cure when he'll live for centuries and maybe even longer? I see you're somewhat agitated by all this, but don't you feel you're being somewhat selfish? That the mind scan is, a, is of course, you in your own shoes? Do you think he'd give up those rights? Of course he should. Like I said, he's going to live forever. Besides, I'm more important. Well, I suppose this brings us to the root of the matter, Jake. Do you believe that mind scans are in fact human? No, I do not. I am Jake Sullivan, and that thing is just a terrible copy of me. Nothing more. Ask my friends, my family, and even my dog. They all know who the real Jake is, and they'll tell you that I'm the real Jake, and I deserve my rights. Well, I'd like to thank you, Jake, for coming on today, and I do hope that you figure out this whole mind scan issue and get to the bottom of it. Our next guest is Mr. Kurzweil. Welcome to the program. Why don't you tell the audience a bit about yourself? Well, hi, folks. My name is Rick Kurzweil. I'm the director of engineering at a little company. You might have heard of it. It's called Google. <laughs> All right. I'm also an author, an inventor, and a futurist. Now, you have some interesting ideas about the future of artificial intelligence and organic and synthetic interactions. Care to elaborate with us? Oh, well, certainly. <laughs> I'm sure you're all aware. Computers have become an increasingly integrated in almost every aspect of our lives. Now, as far as I can see, we're heading toward an unavoidable blending of artificial and organic consciousness. At a future point, mm. a moment in time I'd like to call the singularity. The singularity, you call it? How very, very interesting this idea is. No, thank you. Mm. Certainly is. You see, with advances in nanotechnology and robotics, the line between organic and inorganic life has begun to blur. Within the lifespan of my generation, I am confident that the human race will achieve immortality through the use of nanobots and cybernetic enhancements. This blending of man and machine, along with the creation of truly sentient artificial intelligence, will lead us irreversibly towards the human world. Interesting theory, Mr. Kurzweil, but surely people will be somewhat hesitant to turn themselves into cyborgs. Also, those to say, <laughs> if we'll get artificial intelligence, get very to humans. <clears throat> and even if we do, what makes you think They'll want anything to do with us. You must understand that we have already thoroughly linked ourselves with technology. How many times have you used the internet today? Don't answer that. Rhetorical question. Granted, 75% of what you use for probably isn't all that productive. Like cats and porn. I'm hoping more not. Never mind. Okay, still, it becomes an inherent part of your everyday life. What about your cell phone? Always on me. Yeah, right. Twenty years ago, they were almost unheard of. And now I'd wager you 
have trouble living with that. It's very true. It's my connectivity to everything. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. You probably look at cats and porn on there, too. Anyway, make no mistake, true artificial intelligence is coming, sir. As far as their attitudes toward their human inferiors go, I believe that they'll show a measure of compassion we ourselves are incapable of. Given that, given, given that, in large part, they will be us, only without any of our human weaknesses. I see, I see. Yeah. Well, for our sakes, I hope you are right, Mr. Kurzweil. And I'd like to thank you for coming on our show this evening. And I hope you enjoyed yourself. Oh, I did. <laughs> And my final guest tonight is Mr. John Cyril. Welcome to the show, John. It's a pleasure to be here, Bob. Do you believe that consciousness can be created? Definitely not. Artificial consciousness will never exist. But why not? If a computer can speak, hear, interrupt, and compute responses in ways very similar to humans, what makes you believe that it doesn't matter if they have a consciousness or not? I believe that consciousness is determined by more than computational processes. The only way to achieve artificial intelligence is through the work of technical, technological advances in computers. This means that AI beings are nothing more than highly developed memory chips and wires. They are able to use programming similar to like a computer would do, and they would receive input and designate outputs already ingrained in their system. Boo! Mr. Kurzweil, if you do not be quiet, I will have security escort you off this premises. Yeah, yeah! <laughs> Mr. Kurzweil. <laughs> so how does this differ from any way that a human would think? Humans have computational systems similar to computers or AI beings. However, humans also possess other mental pathways that allow them to interpret their mental inputs. What do you mean by this exactly? Take, for example, a skee-ball game at an arcade that releases tickets upon its completion. Each game, a different combination of points are accumulated. No two games are alike. However, the machine can identify what input it's, it, it is receiving. From there, it can correctly give the player a designated amount of tickets at the completion of the game. It would appear as if the game knew how to count. In reality, the game is simply correctly interpreting the symbols, inputs it has received and displayed in output that can be misinterpreted for actual understanding. I see. So how would you feel about a process which copies the exact human brain into a nanogel and then transfers this copy into an artificial body? This process is called the mind scan. So you're telling me that an exact copy of the same brain, biological human brain can be copied and put into a new body. Exactly! If there really is such a procedure, I suppose it could pass my standards. As long as there's no addition of memory enhancers or extra parts into the brain. I assure you that there is not. Then yes, in my opinion, this an individual will be considered a full human being due to the fact that no mental processes will be altered. So what do you think about the artificial body? Although the body may take a bit of getting used to, I think people will accept it. Since it still resembles a human and acts just the same as a human would, I see no problem that would be encountered. Mr. Cyril, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show this evening, and I hope you had a good time. It's great to be here, Bob. Cyril Stutz! <laughs> Mr. Kurzweil! Security!